Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gorris, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. And I've discovered on my journey that so much more is possible than we can begin to imagine. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to The Heal Podcast. I am here with Dr. Nicole LaPera, who I am so excited about. I usually just interview for an hour, but I feel like we could talk (laughs) for days and days, and I need your help with everything, but we won't get into that today. Um, If you don't know, Dr. Nicole LaPera is the holistic psychologist on Instagram, has a massive following. Um, She was trained at Cornell University, the new school for social social research and the Philadelphia School of Psychoanalysis. She is the founder of the global community Healing Membership Self Healers Circle and the author of number one New York Times bestseller, How to Do the Work, How to Meet Yourself, and now How to Be the Love You Seek, which we'll talk about today. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, Kelly, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, the honor is truly mine. Um, I just finished the book last night, as I do, I cram. <laughs> Uh, But it's always exactly what I need, you know, at the time I need it. So this book is such a gift. And I just want to talk first about it. Just the the thing that keeps coming up is safety. Mm. And, you know, I've had the like last year, which is a very challenging year. And I was like, this is the year I'm going to be my authentic self. That was like my theme. And I just kept coming up and roadblocks and like just and and your book and your teaching now has made me realize or wake up to the fact that we can't be our authentic selves until we feel safe in our bodies to do so. So I guess the, the I'd love for you to share, you know, really start talking about our nervous system and how our subconscious programs, you know, kind of control it and without addressing our ability to regulate our nervous system which is a brilliant gift and an intelligent design but we because of our childhood trauma or our programming we are in stuck in this stress response and until we learn to reprogram and regulate our nervous system we can't be our authentic selves i i want to commend i think yourself and and everyone out there listening who is on this search i love that words like authentic self and heal and conditioning and really everything that you've been at the forefront for so long is so um, culturally kind of resonant now it is a conversation and I want to commend everyone who is on that journey and I actually began a focus on the body and the nervous system and words like safety these weren't in my vocabulary when I worked much more traditionally and my journey began feeling really disempowered Um, to begin with, with a lot of the clients that I was working with, because I had many individuals trying to find their authentic self, incredibly insightful individuals, knowing that they wanted to create safety and security, maybe healing from their own past trauma, maybe in their own relationships. And yet what I would hear week after week was not reports of empowering shifts, was actually a lot of hopelessness and powerlessness. And it took me really understanding the whole human experience, which includes the body, the nervous system, which is evolutionarily wired to seek safety, to really understand why so many of us are stuck. And spending a lot of that time actually and applying it to this book, working with couples, I think nowhere do we see these patterns, even in the subtitle, right? Break cycles, another common buzzword. We're cycle breakers. Well, why are so many of us stuck? It's because in that subconscious part of our mind, we don't actually have safety and security created because back in childhood we didn't have the attunement that we needed we didn't have the resources maybe that we needed to meet our needs and so the reality of it is as adults very few of us actually know what the embodied experience of safety and the security is and what we then end up relying on outside of our awareness of course is those habitual patterns because they feel safe to us so i love this as a starting point because safety i can't talk enough about it in my own journey included really understanding how conditioned I was and how much the patterns I was seeking, the habitual safety I was kind of trying to create was not safe at all. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of stress, a lot of overwhelming emotions. And I think this is what a lot of us come to the conclusion around, which is 
we're not broken necessarily. We're just relying on old habits that served us at one time that actually aren't safe and don't create security and don't allow us to ultimately, like you beautifully said, be our authentic self. Though, of course, with that awareness, we can begin to make new choices. And it's so enlightening when you realize that it's nothing, like, you know, just the kind of quintessential example of like a very intelligent woman that continues to stay in an abusive relationship. And we're like, why? How does she not see? Or how is she choosing that? Like, how does she not have the, she's so smart. She Like, why, you know? And when you, as you so beautifully lay out in your book, when you understand that the mind is literally, the brain is literally designed to seek out the familiar because the uncertain is such a much bigger threat. So we literally like look Mm -hmm. for familiar and patterns to feel safe, but it's such a false sense of safety. And so um, that's just like literally what we're perceiving is not reality it's and we taught I mean there's so many different ways of saying it but the psychologist oh yeah the theory of constructed emotions it's like they're self-created it's not mm-hmm. even reality yeah. I think what you're really kind of highlighting is a difficult reality for a lot of us humans which is how subjective this experience is I think a lot of us have this idea that when we talk about emotions oh things are objective we could all you and I could share the same experience and we would both leave feeling angry if something upsetting happened and that's just not the reality of it. We are constructing and co-creating exactly like you're describing through the way we're filtering the environment. I mean, there's just too much stimulation to attend to or to pay attention to in any given moment. We have to, and outside of our awareness, our brain does that for us. It determines which pieces of information are applicable to us. So even right there, we're already deleting from our experience part of our experience and the same conversation applies and this was mind-blowing for me coming from a training program in clinical psychology where I think most people think oh it's based around emotions it took me until several years out of my program to truly understand what emotions were they're not just thoughts that live in our mind they're physiologies that live in our body and that's another area where we prefer the habitual And this beautifully, I think that example you gave is really common. We might be the person with very well-meaning loved ones shouting from the sidelines saying, why are you still in this relationship? Or why are you pursuing this person? Don't you see those red flags? And in reality, those red flags feel comfortable to us. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, no, we might not be perceiving them or filtering them the way these well-meaning loved ones are able to see. So, and again, I think relationships, because we are relational creatures, our nervous systems, again, down to our wiring, our biological wiring, our physiology, we need those points of connection, that emotional support that comes with relating to other people. And in our relationships, I think, is where the large majority of us, as adults at least, we lack safety and security. So the patterns that we are repeating aren't grounded ones like you're describing, are ones where we maybe are overstepping our boundaries or are in relationships with people that are overstepping our boundaries. And here's where no amount of insight, that very well-meaning suggestion from our loved ones doesn't shift us into ability to be able to change because there's that wiring that feels so comfortable, feels so familiar, knows who we are in that type of relational dynamic. Totally. And I, I, I wrote down some quotes here because they're just so profound in your book. But we are social creatures and our deepest need, you say our deepest need we all have in our relationships, whether we are children or adults, is to feel safe and secure enough to be ourselves without losing the connection to or support of others. So what I've, you know, and I've learned this before, but just for some reason the way that you lay it out in the book is so, it just lands. Um, and, and so our parents, you know, bless their hearts. They were in survival. They were just, Mm -hmm. you know, dealing with the reality of their situation and passed down generational conditioning. And so, you know, if it was, if we, if our perceived environment wasn't safe, like I think you and I both became overachievers Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we can go into those different types and, uh, um, behaviors that we developed, but you know, we adapted to our environment that we didn't feel safe in, and, and we developed behaviors and personas to um, get the love and support and connection we needed. You know, so it wasn't our authentic selves. Of like, we developed what we thought based on 
um, you know, these little kids perception that, oh, oh, it's our fault. We're not lovable. We're not enough. That's why dad's stressed. That's why dad's blowing up. That's why mom's disconnected. That's why mom's in bed all day. Whatever those things are, we took it upon ourselves to have a belief about ourselves that we're not worthy. And then we developed behaviors to try and earn that love. And so, you know, no wonder we are, even as adults, until we start to become aware of those behaviors, which your book will help us do, I certainly did about myself, um, can we start to question whether those beliefs at our core and, you know, that are driving our behaviors are true and if they serve us any longer. And I think the point you're making here, Kelly, is so beautiful because I want listeners to truly hear this, which is these adaptations, these conditioned ways of being, these masks we wear, these roles we play, at one time were adaptive, were the best scenario, the best choice that we can make to keep ourselves as connected as was possible to those earliest caregivers. Mm -hmm. Because that wiring to connect, that need, in childhood it's even stronger because we are born completely dependent. We can't physiologically keep ourselves alive, sustain life as, a, as an infant. So we need whatever version of caretaking, and I know that we definitely individually, there's a span, a spectrum of those of us who had present caregivers able to meet our physical needs, maybe didn't have emotionally attuned caregivers. Some of us might not have had any adult necessarily present at all to us. So the, the most uh, kind of evolutionarily sound thing we can actually do is to adapt, is to keep our focus and attention on sustaining whatever bond or whatever connection was available because those were life-giving. So these adaptations, which absolutely begin very early on, do begin a creation of these beliefs because our childlike mind, just like our adult mind, is always trying to make sense of the world, is trying to anticipate, is trying similarly to keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. So it's always kind of assessing and assigning meanings to the events that are happening. And so in childhood, why, why this is the origin of a lot of beliefs is because when we don't have that emotional maturity that we gain as we age to kind of zoom out and like you and I are having a conversation where we're able to say, yes, we had well-meaning parents, though because of resources, education, maybe their own traumas, they weren't able to show up for us and in the way that we need it, right? This is a mature perspective. We're able to zoom out and see all of the different nuanced factors that impact a person's decisions, many of which have nothing, if not all of which, have nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. In childhood, when we don't have that ability and we're still trying to make sense of why our caregivers weren't physically present, maybe they were physically abusive, maybe they were emotionally absent, whatever the case was for us, the only way our immature mind will be able to make sense of it without all of those mature factors will land on a very egocentric or I, me, I'm the problem, reason so now we have this deep-rooted meaning well the the person i need isn't available to me because of something inherently wrong with me now i make even a stronger case for me to keep that part of me suppressed below the surface and to only be this other person this conditioned being again wear this mask play this role so i just like to emphasize and spend time on this because as we become aware i think many of us can shift into either shaming ourselves for all of these conditioned ways that we were and all of the outcomes that that created, or we immediately have the expectation that we just know who we authentically are and are able to make choices from that space. But I think understanding that these are adaptive, which means that we need it to become this version of ourself. Maybe we can relieve some of the shame that we feel as a result of having made that a choice, again, because all of that was made unconsciously. And then we can give ourselves a little bit of patience and compassion as we try to break these habits or break these cycles because it doesn't happen the immediate moment we become aware that they're there hmm. because they're still playing that protective role. Yeah. And it's so <laughs> automatic, right? It's the, huh? and, and again, um, always learning information and unfolding in such a beautiful way. So I've always known, I've talked about it in the film, like fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. Fawn is a new one. And ironically that's what my adaptive um you know nervous system kind of extreme became so some people become fighters they did get triggered into the fight some people get triggered into the flight distraction run escape 
addiction, whatever. Um, some freeze where they shut down, they play small, they you know um, suppress high, it, and then some people fawn, which is hypervigilance and trying to keep your environment safe by anticipating and making everybody else around you happy. Because if, if they're happy, then right. nothing's going to blow up. So I became a fawner, a people pleaser, a perfectionist, and it's just just that awareness alone and. The first thing I wrote down is imagine what it would be like if you felt truly free to be fully you, which I imagine we do when we're children mm -hmm. in, in certain ways before we're super aware of our environment or feeling unsafe. Um, like, so is there, I just, I don't know anybody who had super enlightened parents and maybe, you know, a generation or two from now will have broken enough cycles that there will be people that don't have to unpack and unwind and heal, you know? Or is that just gonna be part of the human experience, you know? I yet myself have yet to meet, um, I call it a unicorn, I'm endlessly searching for <laughs> the adult, of course, who had um, the level of safely, you know, securely attuned caregiver. And there's many different reasons. I think I, you know, I throw that out, I laugh about it. I say, oh, we're all in this together. But, and there's a reason, in my opinion, at least. I mean, just speaking from my field, it took until, I don't know the exact decade, but it was more recent than not, where you would have heard a clinical psychologist or a parenting expert, if you will, say, or even speak of, much like myself, emotions and what children actually need in the emotional department. For decades of life, all of the parenting advice that our parents had received was much like the way you train an animal. It was very behavioristic in model, which simply is reward the behaviors you want to continue and punish the behaviors that you want to extinguish or, or to go away. And this was, I mean, the predominant expert advice. You would read a book and this is what was considered gold standard in parenting. Mm -hmm. And then of course, if you just kind of think back past generations in terms of resources that were available or not available to our parents, in terms of the circumstances, environmental, socio-political, what was happening outside the home in terms of how they were needing to navigate their circumstances. And now I think you have an awareness and understanding why I can subtitle a book, Break Cycles, and so many of us can say, yes, we need to. Mm -hmm. Because our parents and our caregivers and times before us were limited. They were limited in access to information. They were limited in access to resources, financial included. They were victims of you know structural issues that are still present today. And they just like we adapted. So we, I think, have an epidemic, if you will. And I'm very hopeful for future generations because the fact, I mean, again, your work at the forefront from so early on and now the fact that a podcast and conversations and I have my community and these things are so common, I'm so hopeful because cycles can be broken and we can rewire kind of ourself, in my opinion, as I know you believe down to kind of our, our programming. So it's, it's an inspiring and hopeful time to be alive because with now increased information, with now increased access to resources, with an awareness of how important our body is on this journey, I do think we're equipping future generations to be that free, authentic, individual and i'm really hopeful at kind of how how it's happening to be a part of it and i'm just i'm i'm excited for the future because i think the wounding that we're carrying is is really kind of at a point of shifting for a lot of future generations yeah thank god mm -hmm. thank god and i have yeah i have a uh four to, almost five-year-old and i've been in very much survival like if i'm gonna be honest the last five years there's just a lot of obviously the world went through it together mm -hmm. and then there were just certain familial dynamics and um, and you just don't you're just in survival so you're not aware but you know you do the best you can and I have more resources than most I'm very blessed and I'm I still struggled through that last five you know while I'm raising my child and I'm aware enough to mm -hmm. know like I'm I'm programming her <laughs> and she's soaking up her environment and I'm like fuck this is not good <laughs> Um, but just even things like repair, mm -hmm. we didn't have repair when we were younger, like, you know, and again, that's just, that's just an evolution of psychology and conscious parenting and awareness. Um, and it just gives you grace. It's like, mm -hmm. we're doing, the, the more we heal ourselves, which you talk about all the time, the more we can model and just be because the my little one is soaking up my energy and that co-regulation, that social coherence that you talk about in the book um, imprints them. So the more I heal myself, mm -hmm. she's automatically, I see shifts in her. And I know that, you know, 
she's going to go on her own journey of unpacking and unfolding. And But the more I can practice awareness that like, um, and give myself grace in the moment and, and catch myself from being triggered, the more I'm, I am breaking cycles and mm-hmm. can just, so I just, I don't know. I just feel like I have a lot more space to be and to work it out. There's no... I'm shutting off that perfectionism because um, we're human and we're doing the best we can. And like, if we could make it through and our parents could make it through, we're we're gonna be okay, you know. I want to just speak to this because I do hear very commonly a concerned question, if you will, from parents: or <laughs> is there a, a kind of sensitive period? Meaning, is there a time beyond which change can't happen? That kind mm. of like, oh fuck, you were just like, is it too late? Yeah, like, that's the question. Is yeah, it too late. <laughs> I fucked it up. Is Five it, years. Is this gone? Is the yeah. ship sail? What happens next? And I really want to emphasize here, you know, in in science now we have words for it. Um, neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, and bioplasticity simply means change is possible at any age. And the the point I want to kind of dig into here because I do think as we maybe live into our own humanity for all the perfectionists, I think parenting in general has a lot of um, kind of misconstrued beliefs or expectations, ideas. I don't know exactly the word I want to use here, but I think a lot of parents have this idea that they need to shield or be even those of parents out there that don't consider themselves kind of overachievers like yeah. myself and myself. <laughs> I think generally parenting brings this up with this idea, right, that there's certain aspects of our experience that we need to shelter right, children from. Maybe as we're coming to this awareness of our own wounding and learning about things like repair and embracing our own imperfect nature and we're having all of these moments of awareness, I think a lot of us have this idea that we need to keep that tucked in kind of our bedroom and not tell our children and then this, you know, miraculously shift and change and be this new being for them one day. Mm-hmm. And I could make a case that there's so much value that was missed hiding your process of healing in the in the bedroom because children are sponges. They're looking, you're modeling for them. Even when, you know, this whole adage of do what I say, not what I do is so incorrect. Children are watching. Mm. And so as we begin to model, not inside the bedroom, in full view, our ourselves embracing our own humanity, embracing our own messy emotions, saying, hey, I, I messed up, I yelled at you. I distanced myself, I iced you, I gave you the silent treatment or whatever it was. I said yes and I people pleased you, child. I took away, you know, I gave you whatever you wanted. I really didn't mean to do that right now. As we start to give language Mm. for those moments that are natural of disconnection, of disagreement, even with our children, trying to navigate life with uniquely unique individuals, uniquely unique, but you know, with different humans is going to bring up natural moments, even with our children of disagreement, of conflict of needs that we have to navigate and negotiate. So saying that to say, I think the more honest parents can be about what's going on, of course, within developmentally appropriate language, um, I think that's such a gift to give to our children, to teach a child how to embrace their own humanity and messy emotions. Again, back to what I was saying earlier, I think we have an epidemic of adults who can't do that because things were kind of locked behind closed doors Mm -hmm. because there was this kind of facade and this idea of what parenting is that I believe stripped the humanity of the modeling that is desperately needed for children. So I can make a whole case that all of the parents out there, not only do I celebrate you Mm -hmm. for showing up differently and truly breaking these cycles and helping future generations to rewire that it absolutely isn't something that needs to be hidden, that there's so much benefit by showing your child that you can change at whatever age, there is no too late. And I think that can be one of the most empowering gifts given to our future generations. Yeah, it's the best opportunity to reparent ourselves. Right. And, you know, relationships serve as mirrors. So um, I was joking with my friend Peter Crone, I don't know if you know him, but he, you know, he's so helpful to other people, but he's just single forever. I'm like, bro, you got to dive into it. Like, you're, it's easy to be like up on your mountain <laughs> preaching, but you get in the fire of a relationship and then we'll talk, you know? So he's in a relationship now and I'm happy for him. But, um, you know, the parenting, it's so true. Like, but I want you to touch on the importance of, again, the body and just the re- energy resources and having the foundation, like the psychology and the awareness mm-hmm. and the consciousness is important. But if our body is unresourced, if our, you know, if we don't have the tools to regulate our own nervous system, it's, it's, you know, you don't have the, 
the capacity to repair or calm down or model differently. And that's kind of like, it's like a runaway train. So talk a little bit about how important just the basic fundamental physical needs sets us up for the foundation. Like small example, um, you know, going through it a time and Riley, you know, the first half of her fours were very challenging. And like, <laughs> I didn't do dry January because I wanted to, you know, it's football season. Like, it's very hard <laughs> for me to do dry January. I did it because I knew I needed to be resourced and sleep better and more patient because of the challenging time she was going through. And I couldn't be um, the sturdy leader or... I couldn't ner- regulate my own nervous system if there was alcohol involved. So like just having that break and seeing like I can, the, our resources are so fundamental in our body to show up in our relationships in a more conscious way. Like, so without just sleep, nutrition, movement, all the basics that you can talk about right now. Yes. So the survival mode, I'm really happy we're kind of going to dig a little deeper here. The survival mode that you and I now have both referenced, um, essentially is being driven or stuck in a nervous system reaction. And I'm going to dig into the ones you've already referenced in a second, but the two byproducts of living in survival mode, like many of our parents did, like many of us are, is we are under-resourced. When our body is, especially if it's consistently activated in a stress response, that takes a lot of our body's energetic resources and our attention. So the two byproducts of that consistently without those resources we become more apt to rely on that subconscious autopilot because there's caloric value conservational value when we're coasting on autopilot it frees up energy for our body to take care of say the survival mode that we're stuck in or the hypervigilance the fact that we need to be on edge because there is a threat around so when we are limited in resources we are probably going to rely on that autopilot more. So if that autopilot, again, contains all of these conditioned ways of being, now chances are we're not going to be showing up consistently, that is, more often than not, as our authentic self. Mm-hmm. The second byproduct of survival mode are those more acute moments that I know a lot of us carry a lot of shame, where we are saying and doing hurtful things that we don't mean, where we are maybe distracting ourselves. Those now those four different um, nervous system states I want to dive into, because they're quite universal. When we become stressed, when we notice outside of our awareness, we don't have to pay attention, our nervous system is always scanning. And when a threat is noticed, universally we'll go through the same sequence of events, which often contributes to the shameful behavior that we feel. The first step, mobilized energy, that fight mode, I call it eruptor mode, because it is like we are erupting volcano. That's when we are outward with our energy. We're screaming, we're yelling, we're talking over people, we're dominating, right? We're doing all those things sometimes Mm -hmm. that result in hurt Mm -hmm. the second stop if we can't dominate if the threat is too big if you know fighting isn't allowing us to overcome it then we shift into that flight mode where we distract where we pick up our phone and scroll away where we avoid just uncomfortable conversations altogether or we turn the television on or we leave the room whatever it is next stop on the journey if we can't overcome it if we can't leave it we then enter into that shutdown state where we quite literally, and I, I want to go back to this because that example you gave earlier is I think really important to speak about. The person who is in perhaps a dysfunctional or abusive relationship and who does have people saying, well, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you leave? The answer in many of our bodies is because we are in that shutdown state of our nervous system. When something is overwhelming us, whether it's a physical act of violation that's happening, whether it's an emotionally overwhelming situation, some of us will go into that shutdown state where we can't scream, we can't yell, we can't get the help or use the mobilized energy. We quite literally are immobilized or shut down. And then of course the newer version that we've evolved in in our social nature is fawning or people pleasing, where we've learned actually to get ahead of the threat itself. If we can be so attuned and vigilant to any possible scenario that might end up being threatening, and if I could extinguish or remove the threat before I get there by pleasing, by saying yes, or by tending to whoever it is in front of me that might be exploding, then I could keep myself safe. 
So again, survival mode, when we are in survival mode, we are lacking resources and we're more likely to enter into those shameful moments. So not only is it so important to be aware again that our nervous system is driving those moments, because I think for a lot of us, it will relieve the shame. It's very painful when we say and do hurtful things, especially in our close relationships. It will then give us the possibility of making new choices, which isn't just white knuckling or affirming ourselves into that next moment. It's as you beautifully described, actually caring for our body, our nervous system, making sure that we are well resourced, making sure that we're getting nutrient dense foods, making sure that we're sleeping well at night and that we're building in moments of rest even throughout our day when our body needs to, to pause or to stop. On the other side of that, making sure that we're expending our energy and we're moving it and we're stretching our muscles, making sure that we're getting the oxygen and the water that we need. So foundationally making those choices and then paying attention in real time as we're noticing ourselves going into those survival modes and then learning in that in that moment how to regulate or to calm our body will allow us to shift. So again, I think this is another area where we carry shame, we carry these habits, we can't break them until of course we include our body in the conversation and quite literally teach our body how to deal with more and more stress over time. So good. And you have examples in the book of different relationships of people that, you know, were clients and you've helped through and they're just such great examples because as we start to do the self-reflection and the awareness of our own, you know, adaptive behaviors, like I said, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I'm a fawner, which I've known I'm a people pleaser, but now it, like, I understood more kind of why and how it's just really ingrained. And when you have, when you feel a threat, that program is, that neural pathway, like you literally feel mm-hmm. like you might die mm-hmm. if you don't, if people are disappointed or you, you know, you lose connection to your caretaker as an infant. Mm -hmm. And so that's that depth of I'm going to die if I lose connection is still there and running the show, even though it does not apply anymore because we're adults. But like, you know, so just to become aware of that. And then you can also start to in relationship, whether it's your four year old that's driving you nuts (laughs) or your your partner, you can kind of start to see, oh, take it less personally because you know they're just in their survival mode and trigger and they're just doing what they're, they're really triggered and in fear um, Mm -hmm. and not feeling safe. And so just to have that awareness like Mm -hmm. shifts everything. And then of course you have to practice so that you can pull out of that and regulate yourself. But it's, I mean, what a gift to have that awareness. It's, I think it's so incredibly important that awareness because it, legitimizes how overwhelmed we feel in those moments because i think this is another area where we can kind of try to uh, spiritually bypass ourselves or gaslight ourselves right where we're like or maybe other people have tried to gaslight us like why are you reacting like this it's not that big of a deal yeah. and you said it really beautifully kelly it is we are back in time as if as if we've gone back and we aren't right the adult in the adult body anymore the emotions that we're feeling are that overwhelming and at the same time what we're now reliving the memory of is not being an adult now who can make the choice or does have the resources or does have the supportive attunement that they need we go right back to that under-resourced overwhelmed child who can't see any other way out of it which is why we then become reliant on those old habitual patterns that were formed at a time where there was no other way out of it so I, i can't say enough about this awareness in this space um, of, of knowing because again it's these are the moments where we shame ourselves for feeling as physiologically overwhelmed and incapacitated as we are and again when we are back in that childhood and we are feeling alone and, and, and under supported now again even in our brain the area for physical pain is being activated so I can't emphasize enough that the feelings that we're talking about again emotions are real in our body Right? Those moments are just as overwhelming for us as they are for other people. And I think the gift of becoming more compassionate of ourselves is that extension of compassion. Now we can see our loved ones when they're in their own survival mode reactions. And of course, this isn't to condone any abusive or boundaryless behavior, but this is just to maybe allow us to be a little bit more compassionate in our response in those moments. Because just like us, when we're in those moments, we're not in that grounded state. 
We're not in the adult part of our brain. We're not able to zoom out and truly understand. We are in that very personalized, overwhelmed, hurt, and under-resourced, childlike part of our brain. Yes. And I, I mentioned earlier that we're both overachievers. And you, <laughs> can you just touch on some of the um, kind of other, mm -hmm. you know, what you become so that people go, oh, that's what I identify with, so they can learn more. Just becoming aware of that, like, oh, yeah, I am the caretaker. I am a yes person or I am an overachiever. Talk about, you know, some of those behavioral personalities that we develop in order to, you know, get the love we're seeking. So those the masks and that role masks, that yeah. I referenced earlier can become a, a personality, a way we show up, kind of like our part of relationships, the more consistently, right, that we go into, into that mode. So it can become our relational identity, if you will. And the term I, I offer in the book is what I call conditioned selves, mm. right? And again, I'm emphasizing this because this isn't, right, oh, I, this is adaptive for me in this time, and then once this time or this relationship is over, of course, once childhood completed, I don't need that anymore, right? This becomes an assumed identity. And for a lot of us, the only way that we know how to be in relation with other people, and more so, again, they are neurobiologically wired into us, right? This whole conversation we're having, where a lot of them even map on to these different nervous system states of survival mode, of dysregulation. Right. For instance, what's coming to mind when I hear you describing yourself as a people pleaser and this hypervigilance and this fawning, the characterological, right, when I become that in my identity, I can become what I call a yes person, where I am almost the ultimate people pleaser, again, driven by my nervous system, who feels safest, being so attentive and attuned to everyone, everything outside of me, I just become that kind of bobblehead that just, yes, keep the peace, whatever you want, I'm meeting everyone outside of me needs and I'm not looking inside of me at all. And of course, there's other versions of these kind of personalities. And I think I give maybe 10 of them. This is not a mutually exclusive list. And I'll just preempt all this by also saying, you might see different aspects of yourself in different, in different kind of characterological patterns. So mm -hmm. we have the yes person. We have another very common one, the caretaker, who's always showing up in care, usually physical care of another person, kind of maybe even making that your career. I know a lot of this gets kind of we can go down the pathway of then we become this for our career and mm -hmm. then our, our finances wrapped up around all of this. And caretaker, I know, is one for those overachiever, as you and I talked about. Um, someone who, again, in childhood was driven for whatever reason for me. I had a very emotionally withdrawn mom, except when I was achieving, when I was excelling academically or athletically. That's when I had my mom's most attention. That's when I had her validation. That's when I felt most connected to her. So then I continue to become right this achievement-driven person in all of my relationships. Other side of that spectrum is what I call an underachiever, where maybe in childhood we gained safety, not in being the front of attention like I did with my mom, but getting no attention by kind of being the wallflower, not causing maybe trouble in a family where there was a lot of active stress. And then we continue to be that underachiever in our relationships where we don't take up space, we don't have needs, we kind of, again, fall to the back. As the whole conversation I think that we're having, becoming aware. So again, these is not a mutually exhausted list. There are other conditioned selves. The first step for anyone listening is just become aware, as simple as that. Begin to notice how you show up in your relationships. Is there a particular role you play, dynamic, right? Do you factor in, do your wants and needs get any consideration or is there a role you're playing for someone else? And then again, once we get clear or conscious of all of that conditioned way of being without shaming ourselves, because remember they're adaptations, now again, as simple as it is, as difficult as it is, the journey is breaking those habits, actually dynamically now showing up differently in our relationships. So when we become clear of how we're habitually driven, like you said, it feels like it's coming from this deep place within us. You know, it feels like it's just instinctually who we are. Mm -hmm. For a lot of us, these identities feel like who we are until we're suggested the possibility otherwise. And then I think some of us, especially older adults, feel shameful when we come to realize that we don't know yet who we are because we've only been operating in this identity and the safety of this identity for so long. So my statement to all of you out there as you're beginning to rediscover who you are, noticing that you've played these roles or you've been this conditioned self isn't to shame, it's actually to celebrate the space that you can now create and the journey of discovery to, to become more present to who you are.
Yes. And on that, um, you know, that awareness is the first step to any, you know, healing, I guess, and acceptance and awareness. But you talk about like the pause and body consciousness, mind consciousness, and I think maybe soul or heart consciousness. Can you just touch on those? Because, you know, obviously you dive deeper in the book, but those are tools where we can, once we have the awareness, then we can put into practice kind of starting to, you know, create new neural pathways or reprogram um, our beliefs so that we do come into connection with our true selves again. So this pause, even if I just want to simply speak to what that is, mm -hmm. it's interrupting, for lack of a better word, our autopilot. Because then our, again, our autopilot for the large majority of us is what's taking us through our day. It consists of all the habits, the kind of typical things that we do. It consists, as we've been talking about, of all of these conditioned ways of being, these habitually reactive moments and the way that, again, our nervous system has learned to kind of create safety. So when we're not pausing, that's what's kind of at the wheel, our autopilot. So as simple as it sounds, kind of just that pattern interrupt of saying, wait a minute. And the initial pause we can make is, let me just become present to where my attention is. And that's the first exercise that I offer because I believe it to be so foundational that it's actually uh, my membership self healer circle every month. It's I think four years old, a little over four years old. Now we release a new course. So at this point there's 40 plus courses wow. in there. And so anytime we have a new enrollment, we open up for new memberships. We will always direct new members to the first course that we've ever released, not to go through se sequentially. It's a library where they can kind of pick and choose. But that first course is around building, foundational consciousness because without it our autopilot is calling the shot so even just listeners right here right now right if i were to ask you you know as you're tuned in of course you're listening to us speak here right now how aware are you of, of your body right kind of just continuing to emphasize the importance of our bodies so many of us spend so much time if not our whole day all of our time in our mind right here you are listening to something are you lost in thought when is the last time you've had actually had contact with your physical body right so the check-in and the pause could be as simple as whether you're doing it right here with me now or you're setting an alarm on your phone or maybe putting a post-it note on your bathroom mirror in that moment noticing without shame or judgment where your attention was many of you will notice oh i'm lost in thought i'm you know i'm somewhere else entirely i'm worrying about what just happened or i'm thinking about what could happen next and then giving yourself in that moment of pause the empowering choice that you can make which is becoming more connected to your body. So noticing again, how does your body feel? And even marrying in this kind of the stress and the resource conversation that we had, the three kind of pillars that you can look at in terms of your body are your breath. We're always breathing. The quality of our breath often is reflective of the amount of stress in our body. So if you begin to pay present attention, right, unhooking, the focus of attention from all the thoughts in our mind or maybe other people you're worrying about right now and refocusing on, on your breath another area that shifts when we become stressed are our muscular our musculature tension mm. so noticing your muscles are they at ease are, are you carrying tension are they so weak you don't feel like you could get up at all that's again a, a testament of that shutdown state of lacking motivation that i described earlier and then your heart rate begin to pay attention this kind of opens up the conversation around heart consciousness, around your heart, right? Is it elevated? Is it beating nice and strong in its normal rhythm? Or can you barely feel your heartbeat at all? And so by hitting pause, and again, this isn't, like I call it like the light switch model. We can't just do this practice once and be like, oh, now I'm conscious throughout the day. <laughs> this is, again, the commitment to noticing all of the moments when your attention isn't grounded in your physical body, and why do we want it there again? Not only does our nervous system live there with all of the cues of stress, giving us a kind of a likelihood of how we're gonna go back into those kind of uh, nervous system states of dysregulation, it also is the house of all these emotions that have so much important value. So by hitting the pause, by becoming consciously present to my body, by maybe beginning to pay attention to those three areas, how is my breath, how is my heart, how are my muscles, now I can start to get reconnected with all of that information that my body is sending up to my mind outside of my awareness throughout the day anyway, mm -hmm. right? And now we can not only get clear on maybe why we do struggle to be our authentic self, why we are finding ourselves in moment after moment of reactivity, right? And then in that space, we can make those new choices 
to regulate our nervous system, to care for our body in those consistent ways that we've talked about, in those as needed ways, when I start to feel myself getting stressed in the moment, calming myself down, and then actually making space for that authentic being. It's so true, and, and a lot of people, like meditation, as a practice, I practice every day, I do like Joe Dispenza's meditation, or I do transcendental meditation, but as you talk about it, just getting, we're so in our heads, so like nice. dropping back into our body and reconnecting with our breath and, and just like disconnecting from the hook of our minds, it does create that awareness. And, you know, as you learn more about the body and how the body is our subconscious mind and picking up mm -hmm. signals from the environment all the time, it's our greatest tool and our greatest ally. So if we can start to have that practice of awareness and drop more into our body, whether it's through meditation or pausing or both, grounding in nature, mm -hmm. um, we start to get more sensitive or, or we remember um, mm -hmm. the gift that our body is and, and our heart it's just such an indicator of like, if we're on the, it's our, it's our, it's, you know, that's why muscle testing works. It's mm -hmm. like our body tells us what's good or bad. Like, do we feel expansive when we think about this option or do we feel constricted? Like the more sensitive and attuned we can become, the more we can really like just tap into this brilliance that our body provides. It's so interesting. I think what is happening in humanity in a lot of ways, it's kind of like we're, recycling back I mean I think when I think of the ancients and, and really ancient wisdom it was very grounded on the body when I think about lifestyle right back of our ancestors it was very foundationally driven by the body and how we just navigated life and the things that we had to do we didn't have the technology to be able to live less in our body we had to and then we had this huge kind of industrial revolution, technological revolution, right? Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. And we, the field, my field, clinical psychology, right? Hangs all of the power on the thinking mind. And then we become kind of this bobblehead and we become really disconnected, validated again by even, you know, update science, this being. And the reality of it is, is all of the information, all of the wisdom, all of the power, all of our intuition, lives in our body mm. so it's so beautiful to kind of see us what i believe is kind of going back to our roots in so many ways seeing so many you know people just speaking more about the body seeing even my field very make huge strides in terms of including these conversations and the body and the nervous system into you know their treatment protocols so again i think it's it's so cool to watch us kind of return to that wisdom mm -hmm. and it's going to be interesting to continue to watch the uh, intersection of, of technology and all of the ways that we can remain distracted in our head now as an AI bot, right? Yeah. And how do we keep that in a grounded and utilize? Because I will never be one to say all anything is negative. Mm -hmm. You'll never hear me talk negative about technology or social media, again, because it's what created the possibility in my life to be able to have impact and to serve in this way. So it's gonna be interesting to watch kind of how we continue to evolve with the emphasis coming back to the body and while at the same time we have all of these opportunities to stay disconnected from the body. So how mm -hmm. do we resolve and live with both of those realities without I think is a natural tendency just kind of saying one is wrong or bad. I think it's more of an integration of being a grounded being and consciously and intentionally maybe using our powerful mind and all of this beautiful technology mm -hmm. in a intentional way. Yeah. And as you're saying that and mentioning AI, <laughs> I'm like, there is this call and this like, pair, like a, a returning back to the sensitivity of our body and that intelligence and our intuition and cultivating that because we're going to need to, to <laughs> discern from AI, like what's real truth and what's fabricated, you know? So like we do need to be in touch mm -hmm. with our bodies more than ever yes. and start so to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's amazing. So um, let me just check our time here. Okay, good. Um, I'd love to get a little personal with you because I, I see what you've built on Instagram and, um, you know, I have these intentions to, you know, step into my authentic self and then... I want to like shout from the rooftops, but then there's all the, you know, you factor in all these other things. So I'd love you just to share, I know you mentioned your dark night of the soul in the book of, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing about that, or at least just the timeline of like, like really starting to have the safety to step into your authentic self and share it and how that 
went in parallel with you know your success or your what you what you realize like I know Oprah said if I realized that I could be this wealthy I'm just being myself I would have started years ago <laughs> or whatever that was you know so I'd just love for you to inspire um, us and give us more of a nudge like as you took the leap to be yourself like what you know was it was it fast did you because it's a practice mm -hmm. right so show me that journey give me a little ditty it, I appreciate this question because so much of the public journey I think that people now you know are visible to is is in parallel to my individual journey of healing of deconditioning of kind of breaking down this tendency to be this achiever and to be more authentic in how I present and so several years into that practice becoming really disempowered doing a whole lot of learning on my own seeking not only to be able to to work more effectively with my clients but also seeing myself repeating so many of the similar patterns yeah. and being just as stuck as they are so trying to help myself and yeah. learning about the body learning about this holistic world thinking then and beginning to update my practice in terms of working holistically beginning then to work holistically and seeing and finally starting to feel like I was gaining some traction right now I'm watching of course because I'm still a human I have my own Instagram account I'm watching how everyone's using everything <laughs> I'm like oh my gosh this is so interesting look at this whole new world and how people it's not just for individuals anymore people are beginning to share you know service and their story and their journey and Meanwhile, two things on the personal side. Not only was I taught in my training program not to share, not only my own personal healing journey, right, where to be a blank slate in the room, the focus is on the clients, and I absolutely understand the intention behind that. So I was taught not to share my own healing journey. And in my own personal life, much like you, the people pleaser, all I had done was water down myself and my perspectives in all of my relationships, usually for me to avoid an imagined upset that my truth might cause, mm. that a conflict that my truth might cause. So now here I am faced with an internal conflict because now I'm starting to really believe in my, my new truth. I'm starting to really see the importance of sharing my own individual journey aside from saying, hey, I'm a psychologist and I now believe in the holistic world. I started to feel it was important for me to be a human who was struggling with the same things and and so, I had this desire, right? And at the same time, I had all of this conditioning. Didn't go away immediately overnight. And this is why I like to share the story because it wasn't just a moment. Oh, well, it's important. I need to share it. No, it was, this is important. Don't share it because what will your professionals, what will your colleagues think? What will your family think if they start to hear more of your own journey that you've never even shared with them? What will, what will other people think? What will they do with this information? Right, so kind of this combating wills if you will and even your clients like oh they what don't will, trust me if i haven't gotten all figured out what will my clients think and i think that's a really common concern of why we're not to be human right we don't some extent that's our concern well i don't want to present to someone that i don't have it all figured out because mm. clients do have this idea and i've come to realize that what clients want what we all want if i'm being really honest we want back to the conversation we had about your children we want honesty we want humanity we want imperfection we want someone saying you know this is hard i don't actually have it figured out yes. we'll figure it out together right that's really what we want so i share this because i think when you see someone like myself who's public right who's putting myself out there in this way i think the assumption is that maybe i've always wanted to do this right or that it's easy for me and it, it's not so me getting clear on what authentically was true for me, what my perspective was, even what my narrative about my own experience was. I'd gone through so many iterations of my own story from, oh, I had this happy, great childhood. So you know what? There were things that I didn't get met fully in my childhood, and that's okay. But here's the repercussions of that and the outcomes, and right, I can create change on that. So being who I am authentically and at the same time, right, navigating all of this conditioning, telling me not to be who I am, mm -hmm. is still present to this day. Because while I've gotten practice at it, right, I've spent four years now going live, sharing myself, writing books, of course, all having all these fears still wired in. I mean, this book in particular, I'm still on the tail end of what I would call a, an emotional hangover from vulnerably putting so much of myself into this book from speaking to so many people, all opportunities I'm so grateful to have had on the podcast by having some book events a month or two ago around this book, I feel now on the other side of it so raw and so vulnerable from something that is very exciting. I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to put a book out, but it doesn't negate 
how my conditioning is factoring in, right? How I still have fears, how now when I put myself out there, I can hear very directly sometimes feedback from people, misunderstanding, misinterpretation, maybe even that upset that I've desperately tried so hard to avoid. Mm. So I always like to share the behind the scenes because I think a lot of times people think think one thing really simply of what you know is imagined is the case. Um, but just continuing to teach myself how to be who I am regardless of kind of what else, what other people are wanting or needing of me is still top of mind to this day, as is all that conditioning that's telling me to do otherwise. Um, and it's still a daily navigation. And I like to just be you know, honest to that extent because it's not, it doesn't go away, this conditioning. Um, the opportunities though that I have now created in my life have given me the possibility to work toward being more authentic and have spaces in which to be more authentic. Yeah, and be able to, you know, as you are more in touch with your authentic self and you then are able to have more intimate connections with people, um, you know, you feel more secure so that you can handle, you have a little bit more resilience and space mm -hmm. to handle those comments that completely misinterpret you or are triggered by you or, you know, because that's, we all like, <laughs> I just don't, I just, I hide in the sand. I don't even read our <laughs> comments. <laughs> like. You know, because I'm just not, I just don't, I'm not there yet, you know? And, uh, but I do have this desire to, like my whole thing and my human design and my astrology, it's all to um, experience and then share what I experience to help others, you know? And it's mm -hmm. like the healer archetype is in all of the things. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I just, and then I, I just to make light, uh, you are so personal in the book and the, the last, um, I guess it's the epilogue, you talk about your relationship. And I just want to say, like, look, you know, one one partner is hard <laughs> enough. And you're like, yes. OK, I've mastered one relationship. Now I'm going to bring in another and get the whole like. <laughs> so talk a little bit about your relationship, because I'm just in awe. Like, it's so beautiful that you shared, um, you know, what what, you know, society may call an unconventional relationship. But also just that exploration, I think, is so beautiful like how you know but again i'm overwhelmed with one relationship how do you do two <laughs> well we'll get to how it is is i've not mastered by any stretch of the imagination any relationship yet at all um but again this applies exactly to the conversation extension of what we're talking about now with which is authenticity and so as in my personal side of things before i decided to publicly share um first it happened on instagram and then i obviously wrote it in the book i we so had met uh Jenna, a partner who was more of a business partner at first, very aligned, kind of was thinking, creating something similar in terms of what we wanted, a community-driven model for holistic healing. So when we opened up the circle, she joined the team and she was like kind of in instinctually like the person who would co-create this alongside of myself and my partner to whom I'm married. Um, I've been together with for a little over 10 years now, Lolly. And so working in close proximity, getting to know each other more personally, year or so i forget exactly how much time we were kind of physically in relation with each other before feelings i think started to happen kind of beneath the surface for all three of us though i think on lolly and my side of things we had kept them really kind of wrapped up the feelings because i had never been in anything but a traditional conventional monogamous two person and i'd been in many serial monogamous relationship ever so i would have never entertained kind of any thought personally of like a tr well i would have entertained an injury i would have noticed maybe i was attracted to someone i'm not gonna lie like, oh, yeah, yeah. Not attracted. Don't <laughs> anything else. Uh, i would have entertained though like oh maybe something can be done about this that includes lolly right that wasn't in my vocabulary mm -hmm. and i'm very grateful so jenna the third uh is so heart driven is kind of led her whole journey just from her heart, you know, for so long. And me being on the other side of thing, right? I'm in my mind, I'm overachieving. I wouldn't dare speak of what's on my heart, especially if it's gonna upset someone else. So I was very fascinated and, and inspired by her as a person. And so her very heart-driven nature compelled her one day to acknowledge her side of, of the equation and to sit both Lolly and I down and to acknowledge that, that what was going on for her and there had been some conflict, I think, because the three of us weren't necessarily speaking what was on our heart or on our mind around this attraction that no one was talking about. So long story short, when Jenna presented it to both Lolly and I, and Lolly and I both being very committed to 
developing a relationship that had space for both of our wants and needs. So I was interested myself in Jenna and equally open to Lolly being as well and wanted her to be, you know, have the freedom to explore. And so we decided to explore an expanded relationship, not having the language, not knowing I would be lying if I said we didn't Google it and learn the word thruple <laughs> at that time that, oh, people do enter into three people in one relationship because we're not necessarily opening it. So all of that happened. We were living, evolving our relationship and I was podcasting with Jenna. I was writing a new book and I was starting to now grapple again with authenticity. So as my account is growing, more and more people are meeting me on the streets. I love it. If any of you see me out in public, please come say hi. I love any opportunity to connect with the community. But that was happening. And there were moments in podcasting when I would self-censor because I would notice I wanted to share a story about, I share a lot, obviously, of my own journey and maybe something you know just applicable happened a couple of days ago, but it happened with Jenna. So now I'm like, oh, I have to, can't say that story. I have to sub the name and that's not feeling good. Mm-hmm. So the three of us kind of sat down and explored what, would, what it would be like if we were more public about it. And, you know, all shared our concerns, all shared our reasons for wanting to be, and all really committed to being in authenticity at all times. I didn't want to be censoring myself. I didn't want to be out in public and, you know, have someone come up on a moment with Jenna and I if we're in an embrace, and then that feels confusing if they, you know, know Lolly as I start to get whatever. So we made the choice to go publicly. And then when I was writing the book, it didn't feel right for me to write a full relationship book (laughs) and not to necessarily update in terms of the direction of of my relationship. So again, it was another moment though of, well, what, what do I do here? Like, do I put something in a book that could so quickly turn people away from the entirety of my message? Or do I honor the authenticity of who I am with my message. And if that happens for some people, then that happens for some people. So I, I took that path um, because again, for me, it's just after living in such a conditioned, watered down way for so long, it was more important for me individually to be myself. And also as I shared online, while it was one of the most unfollowed days on the Instagram account, it was also one of the most supported days Mm -hmm. because so many more people, even if it wasn't anything of interest for themselves in terms of changing their relationship dynamics, right? They were just seeing possibility Mm -hmm. or, you know, celebrating my choice to be authentic. And there was a lot that were starting to see themselves reflected. A lot of people living in non-traditional relationships um, that were feeling very supported from how publicly we were now doing that. So yes, it is very difficult. I'm very much not mastered in any relationship. So really for (laughs) listeners, if you're imagining, that means two now individuals, two different dynamics. They are two separate people, which means I relate to them differently. I connect with each of them differently. Then we have the dynamic of the three of us together. It gives us endless opportunities for us all to work (laughs) on our conditioning (laughs) and to keep ourselves calm and regulate it. Um, And all the feelings, yeah, are are 100% there in terms of challenge, in terms of possibility in terms of fulfillment because i think the beauty of of different relationships in general and this applies i think even outside of opening up and having a non-traditional romantic relationship one of my hopes is to expand the possibility of relationship to give people more supportive of a community because i think we really limit ourselves when we kind of begin to categorize like oh all my friendships should look and feel like this and if they don't maybe they're not my friend instead of saying wait a minute I have the opportunity to connect with uniquely different people. Mm -hmm. They would never all look the same, these relationships. That's an unrealistic expectation. And carving out maybe space to have a friend who you connect with really emotionally. And maybe there's another friend who you don't connect with emotionally at all, but you share the same interest in some area. And maybe there's another friend who you just like to go out and have a good time and laugh with, right? And so I think the more we can expand what we're looking for, I think the more we can create the opportunity to be fulfilled in our relationships. Totally. And what I'm feeling when you talk about that is just it's it doesn't matter the what. It's like if you you're giving people as you model authenticity um, and just that energetic suppression of when you're trying to like you're expending extra energy trying to present to the world and like make sure everything's okay, which is what I do. It's like once we start to heal and wake up, it's you know, you just want to be free so that you have all of your resources mm-hmm. available for you and you're in, and you're nothing's blocking or holding down or draining your batteries so that you can get the inspiration and the gifts and the express so whether it's you know an unconditional or an unconventional relationship or just 
giving yourself permission to look at your, accept your own way of doing things and give permission, you know, people like you give us permission to explore doing things the way that society maybe says they, they're not done because they haven't been done this way before or whatever. Yeah. So it frees up so much energy for us to individually express our authenticity. And um, just on that note, like, uh, I, I started, you know, right before this, I started tearing up because, you know, we always hear about boundaries and like, as I'm stepping into my authenticity, you know, and learning that I'm a people pleaser and I expend so much energy trying to avoid or stay ahead of conflict or just, you know, keep, and, and or break of connection by trying mm -hmm. to keep people happy and then they won't leave me or whatever mm -hmm. that is. Like, so I wouldn't naturally have a lot of boundaries. And so I've read about boundaries. I try to practice boundaries. <laughs> I've been better this past year doing things that I love and putting myself first and self-love and struggling. Is that selfish? But you say it so beautifully in the book. And it just gave me permission so much that it just like brought me tears. Um, so you said, for all the people pleasers out there, boundaries are protective limits we set with others to help us meet our body's physical and emotional needs. We can set these boundaries when we begin to feel on edge, irritable with others, feel overwhelmed, or on the verge of tears without explicit reason or cause, or are unable to express ourselves clearly. That is our body's reaction, mm -hmm. showing us that we are under-resourced, we are in fight or flight or freeze or fawn, and it, we don't need permission. We need to be in touch with our body when we're edgy, overwhelmed, tears without explicit reason, or just unable to express ourselves clearly like that gives us permission oh we need boundary we need to step away mm -hmm. we need to do something that brings us joy we need to call the in the village to watch our kid for a moment so we don't mm -hmm. so we can go take a nap or whatever that is it was just such a beautiful way of again bringing us back to our body and giving ourselves permission to resource ourselves first so that we can show up more authentically and more beautifully for other people and I believe that is the, the pathway to creating that possibility. I don't think that we can overstep ourselves. I know we can't overstep our bodies in that equation. Because in survival mode, the one thing we can't do is we can't think straight. We can't shift perspective. We can't hold someone else's needs in priority to our own. Because when we're in survival mode, we are driven by our own self-focus, by our own self uh, need to survive we are driven by our own perspective we cannot so I think the, the cliche I don't know if it's actually a cliche but the um, the I just got off an airplane myself so the airplane <laughs> you know uh, announcement of putting your oxygen mask on first I know a lot of people throw that around and it took me until more recently to just as simplistic as the message is understand what it meant well because if I've passed out from lack of oxygen then I can't care for the person in the seat next to me. And the same conversation applies to our body and to its need for resources. And I think culturally, a lot of, again, parents, a lot of people in general have had been given and internalized a belief that to care for oneself is to be selfish. And in my opinion, why I spend so long talking about the self, even though it's a relational book and the body in terms of the nervous system as we've been exploring throughout this, is because it is that foundationally important. We can't care for someone outside of ourself when we're not resourced and when we don't have space to meet our own needs. So I think that, you know, the thing we love to hate, oh, care for someone else, it isn't selfish. A lot of us have to do a lot of unlearning in terms of those conditioned moments to give ourselves then that permission to whether it's through daily self-care practices in terms of our nervous system, like nutrition and sleep and movement, like we talked about earlier, whether it's for those kind of self-regulating in the moment um, opportunities, right? We need to remind ourselves and give ourselves the possibility to create that change. Well, thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom and your energy and um, just, again, modeling such beautiful authenticity and, and stepping into your power of you. Um, where can people find you in this beautiful book and your self-healer circle and all the things? Well, thank you. I have to say, I think Harper uh, did a beautiful job on the cover of, of all three of the books, so I, I particularly like purple. So yeah. that book at this point, I'm hoping, is across all major book 
retailers as well as I know a lot of local bookstores are carrying at least one copy. So I love supporting local. I suggest everyone, if they have that bookshop, uh, go on their website, give them a call. I have a website up, howtobeloveyouseek.com that does highlight some booksellers if you do need help in terms of pointing you in a direction of ones that I know are carrying it. I have a website, theholisticpsychologist.com, where you can get more information on my Self Healers Circle membership. And at this point, I have a presence across all of the social media platforms, venues, if you will. So however you like to consume content, <laughs> um, absolutely come over, join the community. The handle is always some version of the Holistic Psychologist. Of course, it all began on the Instagram account, the.holistic.psychologist. So come join the community. Come be a part of these conversations every day. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. See me in the self-healer circle. It's like, you got to do it. I love it. Thank you again, Kelly, for having me. Yeah.